Okay. Um, well, welcome everyone to uh, another TCS Plus talk. Um, it's our great pleasure today to have Scott Aronson, who is from ET Austin, and he's been also visiting OpenAI um, to tell us about certified randomness from quantum supremacy. Uh, so just before we start, I do want to encourage everyone to turn their cameras on, basically give Scott um, some visual feedback and feel free to kind of stop and ask any questions. Um, just unmute yourself. Um, and this talk is being recorded, so I'll post it in our YouTube uh, website, but there'll be a chance to kind of hang out with Scott and ask some questions after the talk, uh, which will be unrecorded. Um, so before we start, let me also thank the rest of the organizers. It's quite a big team at TCS Plus. So that includes uh, Clement Kanon, Rachel Cummings, Anindya Day, Sumega Garg, Gautam Kamath, Ilya Rajenstein, Oded Ragev, Salil Shram, Noah Stevens Davidowicz, um, Thomas Vidik, and David Weiss. Okay, and with that out of the way, I'll uh, give the floor to Scott. Um, so please take it away. All right, great. Well, uh, um, uh, thanks so much, and uh, uh, good to see everyone. It's uh, great to be invited back here to uh, TCS Plus, and uh, I'm glad that it's uh, still uh, going. You know, a after the pandemic, and uh, so uh, uh, so I was uh, asked to uh, speak about uh, this work called Certified Randomness from Quantum Supremacy. Uh, so uh, let me give you a little bit of history here. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about ideas uh, that I mostly developed uh, five years ago. Uh, uh, so that was uh, even you know uh, before uh, uh, the quant you know Google and others had announced their quantum supremacy experiments. Uh, you know we we uh, we knew that they were working toward it, but they you know they they uh, hadn't done it yet. Uh, uh, you know it was before the pandemic, obviously, feels like a different world, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, and um, um, uh, you know, and, and, and we were trying to think about, uh, well, you know, could these, you know, if and when these quantum supremacy experiments uh, uh, with 50 or 60 qubits are actually done, uh, uh, will they be good for anything? You know, will they have any application? Uh, and, you um, and so uh, uh, I uh, came up with something and then I gave uh, talks about it. Uh, I actually got the uh, Google people uh, uh, interested. Uh, uh, we even uh, licensed the uh, IP to Google and uh, they uh, um, uh, um, um, pursued this uh, a bit. And, uh, um, uh, but then, you know, I just uh, delayed and delayed with uh, writing up a paper with the formal analysis. Uh, and it really ended up being too complicated for me to do uh, on my own, uh, in part because I am not a cryptographer. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, this past year, uh, I got my uh, postdoc uh, named uh, Sheehan Hung uh, involved, and he was really instrumental in uh, uh, sort of you know doing the formal analysis, which which we've now you know uh, not only. Uh, 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 proved, you know, all the stuff that I had hoped to prove in, in 2018, but we even sort of uh, uh, knocked off one of the one of the main open problems from that time. Okay, so we've even gone a little bit further and we have a 70 something page paper now, which is on the archive and which is going to appear uh, in the upcoming stock uh, uh, in Orlando. Okay, so um, so let me start by telling you, uh, you know, what is sampling based quantum supremacy? Uh, so this was an idea that uh, uh, I guess you know goes back several decades. You know, Terhal and Di Vincenzo, uh, 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 you know, twenty years ago, you know, in a, a very far-sighted paper, you know, talked about something that you know we we would recognize as this. Uh, but uh, the sort of modern push to do um, uh, a quantum supremacy experiment uh, kind of started around twenty eleven. And this was when um, uh, independently uh, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard, and uh, me and Alex Arkhipov 
uh, came up with models of, of sort of rudimentary forms of quantum computation, uh, which would not be universal quantum computers, would not be capable of, you know, running Shor's factoring algorithm or, or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, uh, what interested us was that they already seemed to do certain things that were hard to simulate with a classical computer. Okay, and, uh, and, and it seemed to us that these things could be demonstrated uh, much earlier than, you know, Shor's algorithm could be used to, you know, factor a 2000 digit number or, 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 or whatever. Uh, so, that, you know, if, if your goal was just to sort of uh, uh, disprove the skeptics of quantum computation, or, you know, just sort of show that, that you know, the, this, you know, the, these e incredibly high dimensional uh, uh, vector spaces really can be harnessed for computational advantage, then maybe this would be the most direct path to showing that. And sort of the key thing that we did in order to um, uh, come up with these proposals is that we switched attention from uh, sort of decision problems or, you know, problems like factoring that have just a single valid answer uh, to sampling problems. Okay, so we thought about problems where the task is to sample from some specified probability distribution, let's say over n bit strings. Okay, and these problems tend to be sort of much easier to sort of uh, uh, natively realize in in quantum hardware, you know, without a lot of clever encoding, right? So, like, if you so so uh, what what Arkhipov and I proposed was something called boson sampling, which was just a uh, 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 this thing where you take a bunch of photons, you send them through a network of beam splitters, and then you measure where they end up. Okay, and where they end up will be probabilistic. You'll get some extremely complicated joint probability distribution over, you know, how many photons end up in this place, how many end up in that place, and so forth. Um, and, you know, what is it good for to sample from that distribution? Well, we had no idea what it's good for. Okay, but uh, we could argue that sampling from that distribution seemed to be hard for a classical computer. Okay, and you know our our evidence for that. Well, it had to do with the fact that uh, the uh, the amplitudes, if you have a system of uh, uh, n you know photons or other bosonic particles, uh, are given by permanence of n by n matrices, and the permanent is a sharp p complete function. And, uh, you know, because it's quantum mechanics, uh, we, we deal with uh, um, um, perma the permanence of matrices of complex numbers. And, and those are sharp P complete, even if you just want to approximate them. Okay. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, and, and now using that, you know, it, it's not as though we can use this to solve a sharp P complete problem, right? Because when you do the experiment, you don't actually see the permanent of a matrix of your choice, right? It's like you see the permanent of a random matrix that was, you know, uh, uh, obtained from your system. Okay. Uh, but what we were able to do is sort of use the fact that the permanent is sharp P complete as well as other facts from complexity theory, uh, you know, Stockmeyer's approximate counting and so forth, to say that if there were a fast classical algorithm that sampled from that same probability distribution that the experiment samples from, then the polynomial hierarchy would collapse. Okay, and uh, you know that, and then you know it gets more complicated when you ask about a, uh, well, how about a classical algorithm that would only approximately sample that distribution, and then you know, but then we could still prove something if 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 we made a stronger assumption. Uh, so yeah, so 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 Bremner, Joza, and Shepard had had similar results, but a different model, and then. Uh, what happened was that in 2014, 2015, uh, Google hired uh, John Martinez, who was maybe the top superconducting qubits experimentalist in the world. And, you know, they just they said, we want to build a 50 or 60 or 70 qubit uh, programmable quantum computer. Uh, and, you know, and they then faced the question, well, uh, what should they do with it? You know that that that's not nearly enough qubits to do full error correction or you know fault tolerance, uh, and you know about the only thing that was out there that they could do was well a sampling based quantum supremacy experiment. So they said uh, you know we we want to do sort of something like boson sampling, except you know more tailored to our hardware. 
right? We don't want to spend an extra hundred million dollars, you know, for the convenience of the theorists. We would like the theorists to take, you know, their proposal and, and adapt it to the hardware that we are building. So we said, okay, we can, we can do that. And then that led to this work by me and uh, Li Ji Chen in uh, uh, 2017, uh, where we, um, uh, we, we studied like what would be the classical hardness of simulating the kind of sampling experiment that Google was planning to do, uh, which is now known as random circuit sampling or RCS. Which is basically just you prepare a bunch of qubits in this, you know, say in the all zero state, you apply uh, a random sequence of, you know, one and two qubit gates. So a random quantum circuit to those qubits, and then you, you measure them. Okay. And that gives you some probability distribution over n bit strings. And, you know, you then, you know, you can run over and over with the same circuit to get many independent samples from that same distribution. And then you can challenge your, your classical skeptic. Well, okay, can you generate these samples using your classical computer? Okay, uh, uh, of course, you know, there's, there's then a question, how do you validate this? How do you prove that the quantum computer was working as expected, right? Because, you know, every time you run it, you're going to see different samples. Okay, and uh, as I'm gonna discuss in this talk, you know, the only way we know how to verify this sort of experiment is to do an exponential time classical computation. Okay, so you have to, you know, do some statistics on the samples that you see, and that requires kind of calculating with your classical computer, well, how likely were those samples to have been generated, you know, by the quantum process, and then, you know, you have to sort of simulate the, the quantum process classically, okay, and that, that sort of inherently limits what you can do here to let's say 50 or 60 qubits, right? There has to be, you know, you know, with a classical supercomputer, you have to be able to simulate it, uh, possibly in a much greater amount of time, but, you know, in order to check the result. Okay, so, uh, so then in, in uh, now, now in starting in 2019, these sor sorts of experiments have actually been done. Uh, so uh, Google was the first to uh, report results. Uh, using their, their superconducting chip called Sycamore, which had uh, 53 qubits, or actually 54 in a sort of two to, you know, in a rectangular lattice, except uh, one of them didn't work. Okay, and they, you know, they applied some random circuits to their 53 qubits. They sampled from the output distribution. They used a classical supercomputer to uh, apply this validation test, you know, and they found a small signal. Okay, a small sort of a uh, signal of uh, uh, you know what you what you see is mostly uniform randomness, right? It's mostly just looks like noise because of all of the error in the qubits. Uh, but you know you get a little bit of signal. Okay, so uh, so so each of their you know they're they're so just to put some numbers on this, they're applying in their circuits about a thousand quantum gates, you know, arranged into twenty layers. Okay, so a depth twenty circuit. Uh, each gate has about 99.5% accuracy, okay? And then, uh, you know, one of their, their key empirical findings was that the fidelity of the total circuit uh, just looked like the simplest thing that you might imagine, which is uh, just the, you know, the, the fidelity of each individual gate raised to the power of how many gates there are, right? So yeah, you know, the, the signal decays exponentially with the gates, which is not surprising. Uh, you know, that, that's why, you know, we need, that, that is why we ultimately need quantum error correction to scale this up. That's why quantum error correction is such a big deal. Uh, but it didn't decay worse than that. Like there were no crazy core conspiratorial correlations between the different qubits. Okay, and that uh, refuted a conjecture uh, by, you know, quantum computing skeptics, uh, such as Gil Kalai. Uh, who who predicted that uh, that there would be such correlations, you know, and and uh, you know if if there aren't, then uh, then you know making quantum error correction work should indeed just be a matter of more engineering. Now I, I should mention that just last night, uh, Gil Kalai has put a, a and two co-authors have put a monster paper up on the archive uh, uh, with with all of their concerns and and quite you know and uh, about. Google's 2019 quantum supremacy experiment. OK, 
Okay, so they've been sort of reanalyzing all the data themselves, and sort of they basically say that that in their view the experiment was too good to be true. So they don't come out and explicitly uh, accuse the Google team of uh, uh, of fraud, but you know they 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 say, well, you know, we think that these results are basically impossible. These you know that they're too good to be true. Now, uh, one problem for them is that uh, the results have actually since been replicated. Uh, by others. Okay, so, uh, you know, USTC, uh, which is a, a university in Hefei, China, um, was a group uh, headed by Chao Yang Liu, and they did a superconducting qubits experiment very similar to Google's. Uh, uh, you know, a little bit more qubits, 60 instead of 53, and a depth of 24, uh, a little bit lower uh, circuit fidelity. Okay, but, um, you know, they saw a similar thing, that the uh, Fidelity uh, just decays exponentially in the in the in the in the in, in the simplest possible way, um, and you know and 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 I I I I hope and expect that there will be more replications soon, as you know lots and lots of quantum computing startups are are coming online uh, with, with with systems that are able to do these things. Uh, Xanadu, which is a startup in Toronto. Uh, demonstrated a quantum supremacy by a boson sampling uh, just last year. Uh, USDC has also done that, I should say. Um, but okay, okay, so, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, um, so this comment that it's like a too good to be true, um, like of course this could be like, you know, fraud or it could be quantum is better than we expected it and that sort of, gives us a new paradigm shift or new optimism well uh, yeah i mean i mean i mean i mean some people might say that but you know i think you know gill has for for 15 years has sort of taken it as an axiom that quantum computing cannot work and so sort of everything every paper he writes about it is sort of starting from that axiom and you know and i actually think it's good for you know someone to be sort of you know playing devil's advocate trying as hard as they can to refute this stuff you know, on the other hand, like if someone who is, you know, who is who is very good tries for a while to do it and 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 they can't, then for the rest of us, you know, it might increase our Bayesian confidence that, uh, you know, it seems like uh, there really is no fundamental obstruction to, to quantum computing. Like, yeah, you know, it's hard as an engineering problem, but we 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 already knew that. Right. And, you know, and maybe the the the, the situation is kind of a lot like the situation of classical computing, you know, before the transistor was invented. It's like, yeah, it's uh, it's really hard to scale, but you know, it's it's hard to scale for you know fundamentally for technological reasons, not because there's there's any there the, 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 there's anything wrong with the basic principles. So you know that would be that that would be my personal position. Uh, you know, uh, um, um, other, others might disagree. Uh, but in the meantime, there's kind of a separate uh, debate uh, that, that, that's gone on about, you know, did these experiments really demonstrate quantum supremacy? Okay, and, and, and for that, you have to ask, well, how hard really, what, what uh, was it for a classical computer to, to, to do the same thing as these experiments? So uh, I guess infamously, you know, Google, uh, when they, um, uh, uh, released their paper in 2019, they said with the best simulation algorithm that, that we know of, which is the one that actually that came from my paper with Li Ji Chen, uh, it would take 10,000 years to simulate this classically. And then the media picked that up and they said, okay, you know, quantum computer does task in three minutes that would take classical computer 10,000 years. And that was the sound bite. Uh, but you know, as many of us expected, uh, yeah, you know, uh, if you if you work on it a little more, you can get a you know a still exponential time, but much more efficient in practice classical simulation. And um, uh, a, a subsequent work uh, by um, uh, um, by 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 Jean Gal, uh, uh, Boaz Barak, uh, Misha Lukin, uh, uh, a bunch of others has sort of chipped away at it. And and I would say that the, the situation today is if if classically you want to 
you know, sort of replicate Google's result, like get a, 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 a sort of score, uh, a deviation from uniformity that's as good as what they saw, then, you know, uh, uh, well, it, it's all just a question of how much money do you want to spend for, you know, uh, classical computing clusters, right? And how much electricity will that take? And you'll probably use about a hundred times more electricity than the quantum computer used. Uh, you know, and the quantum computer uh, needs a dilution refrigerator, you know, to cool down the qubits to 10 millikelvin, right? Which is a very big, you know, bulky thing. So, you know, so uh, uh, so so it's already using a lot of electricity, but, you know, with, with uh, um, classical computing, I would say, you know, we haven't yet crossed the line where we can, we can do it classically as cheaply. So, you know, so there is some quantum supremacy that remains, okay? But, you know, you might say, yeah, you know, that there, there is a, 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 an enormously strong motivation to do better quantum supremacy experiments that would, that would uh, 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 put, put more distance between, you know, the quantum performance and the best classical performance that we can, that, that people can achieve today with very optimized algorithms based on tensor networks and things like that. Uh, so, so I don't regard this as a done deal. And all of this is relevant for, you know, what I want to talk about in the rest of the talk, uh, which is, um, okay, now, you know, you might say the most fundamental objection uh, that people have had to these sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments is, well, you know, even if they work, and even if they beat what you can do with a classical computer, they don't seem good, useful for anything in and of themselves, right? The only point of them is to be classically hard to, 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 to replicate, right? Uh, you know, all you're getting is these, you know, these samples from a probability distribution that takes heroic effort to even just to distinguish from the uniform distribution, you know, over, over n-bit strings. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and who on earth would want that? What is that good for? Uh, so, you know, if you want a quantum speed up for something useful, well, you know, lots and lots of people have been working towards that. Uh, two of the, the, the big candidates that, you know, they're going to try to achieve in the near future, meaning, you know, like, you know, let's say in the era before quantum fault tolerance, uh, will be first of all, simulations of quantum systems, uh, uh, su such as, uh, you know, condensed matter systems, uh, materials, or second of all, potentially, you know, some uh, quantum speed up for uh, combinatorial optimization problems, like maximum independent set or, or things like that. Okay, now now the, the, the trouble is, uh, it is it is not clear whether there are speed ups for these problems that are achievable uh, uh, using, you know, a noisy, non-error corrected device of the near future, right? It's, uh, um, you know, there, 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 there might or might not be, right? There are sort of no principle to tell us either way, right? It, it'll, it'll come down to a question of constants. Uh, so, uh, you know, with quantum simulation, at least once you have a fault tolerant quantum computer, then we become very, very confident that there are speed ups there to be had, even exponential speed ups that should be useful for, you know, chemistry, um, you know, um, materials design, um, other applications. For optimization, you know, even with a perfect quantum computer, we don't really know if one can do much better than the square root speed up of Grover's algorithm. And, you know, with a, with a noisy non-error corrected device, you know, the question is, is even much iffier still. So, you know, of course that hasn't stopped people from confidently claiming that they, that they will get a quantum speed up soon for something useful or even that they already have, you know, but this is, this is my assessment of the situation. So then the question is what is left, right? And um, so, so, so I wanna talk about, you know, the potential to take the already existing quantum supremacy experiments, you know, based on sampling or the, you know, uh, uh, ones of, of, the, of the near future and repurpose them to do something conceivably useful, which is generating cryptographically certified random bits, um, you know, for use in, in, in various cryptographic applications. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, this might or might not be a compelling application, but, you know, with the current devices, I actually don't know of any other application that they have 
uh, uh, to anything, you know, outside of, you know, a, a sort of quantum computer development itself. So, uh, so I do think it's of interest uh, 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 for that reason, if, 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 even if for no other. Okay, so, uh, so let me talk about the problem of generating certified random bits. Okay, so uh, you know there are many many reasons why you know in, uh, in 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 CS why we want bits that are not only random but that you know we sort of know to be random or that we can trust to be random. Okay, of course you know we 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 want private random bits for you know uh, for 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 our cryptographic keys, right? Uh, but you know there are also lots of reasons why you might want public random bits. So bits that that everyone can access and that everyone agrees were you know uh, were sort of generated randomly. Okay, if you're deciding which precincts to audit in a close election, or if you're running a lottery, you know these are kind of the classic or setting parameters for a crypto system. Uh, th these are kind of uh, the classic examples. You know there are various zero knowledge protocols that assume a common random string. And then you know maybe the the biggest application right now would be proof of stake cryptocurrencies. Uh, as many of you might know, just a half a year ago, uh, Ethereum did the merge, which means that they are no longer based on proof of work. Uh, uh, you know, which is uh, of course wastes a tremendous amount of electricity. Uh, they now um, you know if you want to add a new block to the Ethereum blockchain, you basically enter into a lottery. Okay, and uh, uh, you know, the, and like the more Ethereum you have, the more tickets you have to enter. Okay, but uh, so this uh, has, you know, the the uh, at the day that this was implemented, this I think decreased uh, the world's electricity usage by like, well, uh, one five hundredth. Okay, so you know, this is uh, you know, this is like an actual like me you know measurable contributor to you know uh, 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 to CO2 emissions right uh, so so that so that's great okay but in order to do this securely uh, you have uh, they have to constantly run a lottery right you know and constantly generate random bits that everyone trusts uh, right now I think they just source them from the blockchain itself but you know you might or might not trust that right if you're paranoid enough maybe you want um, some other way to get to get so you know so then the question arises how do you get random bits that everybody trusts and um, you know you could uh, uh, you know look at the the stock prices you could look at granules that form on the surface of the sun uh, uh, you know there are lots of uh, 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 cool ideas that people have had uh, uh, but you know why not quantum mechanics right quantum mechanics is you know the one source of randomness that we know about that is rooted in fundamental physics rather than merely, you know, human ignorance of the details of some complicated system, right? So, you know, why not, uh, um, you know, and, 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 you know, it's been known for more than a century how to generate quantum random bits. I mean, for God's sakes, you could just, you know, take a Geiger counter and put it next to some radioactive material and look, you know, to just uh, read off the pattern of clicks. Right, or uh, if you want a you know a quantum circuit, just look at this trivial circuit that just applies the Hadamard gate to make it, you know an equal superposition of zero and one, and then measures it over and over again. Okay, now the trouble is like yeah you know you could build a device that 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 does any of these things that generates random bits quantum mechanically. You could then take those bits and put them on the internet, but why should anyone else trust that? You know that that you actually did what you said you were doing, right? Uh, um, 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 how do they know that you really generated the bits randomly? Okay, and um, uh, so you know your hardware might have been compromised. It might have been backdoored by the you know by some intelligence agency. Okay, you know that that's not just a theoretical worry. You know, a decade ago we learned from Snowden that uh, 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 you know, one of the uh, NIST's uh, pseudo-randomness uh, standards for, uh, 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 based on elliptic curves uh, was in fact backdoored by the NSA, okay, uh, and, and, and was predictable to them. Okay, so, uh, so you know, how, can you, how can you prove that your random bits are trustworthy and that they weren't known to anyone uh, in advance of being generated? 
So, uh, uh, so, so in fact, you know, people have been thinking for a while about uh, how can you design a quantum protocol to solve that problem. And, you know, there was an earlier idea, uh, starting with the uh, work of uh, uh, um, Kolbeck and Renner uh, in like 2006 or so, uh, which was that you could use a multi-party protocol to do this. Okay, in particular, you know, the famous Bell inequality uh, is basically just a, a multiplayer game, you know, a two prover game, if you like, that can be won with higher probability uh, by entangled players, uh, an entangled Alice and Bob, uh, than by an unentangled Alice and Bob. Okay, and you know that was originally designed uh, to to prove, you know, just to prove. Uh, uh, a, a, a form of quantum supremacy, if you like, you know, that uh, entanglement is a real phenomenon in the universe because it, you know, it lets you win this game with higher probability. Okay, but then uh, what was realized um, 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 uh, a couple decades ago is that you can take the Bell inequality and you can repurpose it to get a protocol for generating certified random bits. Okay, basically you can say that if Alice and Bob, you know, can sort of repeatedly violate the Bell inequality when, you know, when, you know, win this game with higher than classical probability, uh, then, you know, they must be doing it with uh, using output bits that were some, at least somewhat unpredictable even to them. Okay, and the reason we know that is that if not, then there would have been a simulation of the whole setup uh, without entanglement, uh, which which would contradict Bell's theorem. Okay, so uh, you know it took work to figure out how to turn that into a practical protocol, uh, in particular uh, because you know the the um, uh, you know when when you when you play this game, this Bell inequality game, uh, you need random bits just to generate the challenges to send to Alice and Bob, right? And so so if you do it naively, then you know you 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 need more random bits to set up the game than you get out by playing the game, and so then it's like it's not useful, right? It you it you know you don't expand the amount of randomness that you have. Uh, so, but but by being more clever, it turns out that you can expand, and you can even take a fixed random seed, and you can expand it into a, an unlimited number of additional random bits. That was sort of the the conclusion of of, of this line of research. Okay, so um, you know the advantage here is that you don't even need a quantum computer to do this. Okay, you need only you know uh, uh, um, uh, Bell experiments, which are now like a, a you know, completely standard, you know, done in, in uh, um, um, uh, um, 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 undergraduate labs even. Okay, although if you want to do it in a fully loophole-free way, uh, that this, this, this slide is out of date, this should say like six years old. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and people actually have implemented you know, the, the, these experiments. Okay, but the downside is that, you know, the whole security of this depends on the assumption that Alice and Bob are separated, that they're not able to communicate, right? As soon as they can communicate, then, you know, they could, they could win using, using, you know, a, a deterministic strategy, okay, uh, without having to generate any random bits. So, uh, so, so now if you're on the internet and you're, let's say, downloading random bits from the NIST randomness beacon, which generates, I think, 512 fresh random bits every minute, you know, how on earth would you know that, uh, that, that, that NIST's Alice and Bob were far away from each other, were unable to communicate? Right. So, uh, you know, would you visit their lab? Like, would you right? So, so, so it would be much, much better if we could do certified quantum randomness with a single device. Okay. And, and, and that's exactly what uh, we proposed to do. Uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll mention later, you know, there was um, independently from us, uh, uh, Zvika Brakarsky and uh, um, uh, Umesh Vazirani and Paul Cristiano had a, a very similar idea. Uh, you know, and, and their their scheme was even you know, like sort of theoretically more elegant than uh, 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 than ours was. Um, but the disadvantage is that theirs seems to require an er a full error corrected quantum computer. Okay, whereas ours is designed to be run on on existing devices. Okay, so so what's the basic idea with our 
uh, 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 certified randomness protocol based on uh, uh, existing quantum supremacy experiments. Okay, so uh, you know the key insight here is that well, you know, a quantum computer can solve certain sampling problems like this random circuit sampling, uh, you know, faster than we think that that a, a classical computer can do. Okay, but under plausible hardness assumptions, the only way to solve these tasks quickly, even using a quantum computer, would be via sampling. Right, you know, you uh, 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 we don't expect that even a quantum computer would be able to quickly solve these sampling tasks in a secretly deterministic way, or sort of you know generate let's say uh, a spoofed outputs that would pass the statistical test, you know, in a secretly deterministic way. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, if, if you, you know, wanted to, if you had a quantum computer, you know, you could reduce the entropy a little bit compared to the naive thing. Like, for example, you could generate a whole bunch of samples uh, and then send back only the samples whose first log of n bits are all zeros. Okay, you know, and then that has a little bit less entropy, but the, but the, the, those would still be samples with a lot of entropy in them, right? And if you're really doing running the protocol correctly, I mean, the real distribution that you're supposed to be sampling from, you know, over n bit strings has almost n bits of entropy, like you know, n minus O of one. Okay, and so you know, if you're really sampling from that distribution or something like it, then as a free byproduct of you know passing the quantum supremacy test, you should also be generating bits that can be certified as you know really having come from a quantum computer that did the sampling process, you know, and therefore really having entropy in them, you know, and not you know just pseudo entropy, right? It's you know if if it came from the quantum computer in this way, then that is that is genuine you know randomness. Uh, that 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 wasn't there before in the universe. Uh, so um, so so the you know the, the beautiful thing here is that this would require just a single device. You know, uh, be great for for you know remote use over the internet. Let's say, which is you know which is how quantum computers will be available to us for the foreseeable future. Uh, it's very very well suited to you know like the one thing that we know how to do with a near term quantum computer. That, that seems to get any kind of speed up over a classical computer. Um, uh, but, you know, there are caveats. Okay, so, uh, you know, we will, uh, so, so the whole uh, soundness of the protocol will depend on some computational hardness assumption, right? And we can see that because, you know, certainly if you had, if the server had unlimited computation time, then it could just brute force search for like what, whatever message would make the verifier accept with high probability, right? And you know, and 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 then you know there 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 would be nothing to say. Okay, so you know we'll have to make a hardness assumption. The the technical work that we do is mostly towards showing that you know there is some you know we have to invent a sort of boutique hardness assumption, but you know but that there is some plausible looking hardness assumption that suffices. Uh, for this application, okay, that like based on which you can prove that uh, that that this kind of scheme is secure. Okay, now the other big big uh, 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 disadvantage that I want to be upfront about is that uh, the the verifier, in order to verify what the quantum computer is doing, needs exponential time. Okay, for the same reason as in you know the sampling based quantum supremacy experiments themselves. Uh, so for that reason, you know, this proposal is inherently limited to experiments, you know, to, to, to servers with, let's say, 50 or 60 qubits. Okay, so, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the thing that doesn't kill it entirely is that, first of all, the verification doesn't have to be of every round. It can be of only a tiny, tiny number of, you know, uh, of, of randomly selected rounds. Okay, and and that's enough to sort of spot check what the server is doing. In fact, maybe you don't even have to do the verification. You just have to credibly threaten that you could do it, you know, in order to keep the server honest. Uh, you know, and 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 it could be done at, at your leisure, right? So like the serve, you can force the quantum computer to respond to your challenges in a matter of seconds, and then if you like, you could take days 
to do this, you know, to do these occasional verifications. Okay, but you know, it is a problem that uh, you know, sort of the the uh, uh, the scale of the experiment is limited by by the need to verify the results classically. And for that reason, you know, the 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 amount of security that you can hope for this way is also limited, right? Like a a uh, you know, it becomes just a matter of how many billions of dollars does an adversary have, you know, to build enough uh, uh, classical you know cloud servers, and you know, if they had enough, then they could spoof your your sixty qubit experiment, and then then you would no longer have security. So you know, that's that's probably the the, the central open problem here. Okay, but you know, one interesting thing about this proposal is that it inherently requires quantum mechanics. Okay, why is that? Well, you know, imagine that we had a secretly classical server, right? I mean, you know, a, a classical server could always take its randomness source and replace it by a pseudo random one, you know, with and, and you know, under the assumption that the pseudo random uh, generator is secure, the client would be unable to detect that. Right, uh, or you know, they would need time exponential in the length of the key. Okay, uh, uh, so 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 then why? What? Uh, how is this certified randomness possible with a quantum computer? Well, in some sense, we're using one of the fundamental facts about quantum algorithms, which is that you know, it, with a with a quantum algorithm, like there's no way to sort of pull the quantumness out of it or the randomness out. Right, there's no way to sort of take the randomness in quantum mechanics and replace it by pseudo randomness in a way that you, in the way that you can do with sort of the random bits that would be fed to a classical randomized algorithm. Right, so you know that difference is used over and over and over in quantum complexity theory, and this is yet another example of it. Okay, uh, uh, we we sort of we are doing something using a quantum computer that would just not have been possible via any classical protocol. Okay, so you know, and 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 indeed, one could say that our protocol requires certain tasks to be easy for quantum computers. You know, uh, uh, these sampling tasks, but it requires other tasks. You know, uh, uh, like you know, deterministically generating. The, you know, those outputs to be hard for quantum computers. Okay, so we're using both the abilities of quantum computers and their limitations in this protocol. Okay, now the, the, the next big objection that people have is, well, okay, uh, 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 you know, just like with the earlier schemes based on the Bell inequality, uh, in order to run our protocol, you know, you need this, classical verifier who challenges the quantum computer over and over, right? And gives it circuits, you know, the, the, the verifier is gonna keep giving the server a circuit, a quantum circuit and say, you know, now, now run this circuit and give me a sample from its output distribution, you know, and, and, and so forth. And so then how is the verifier generating these circuits? And you could say, well, if the verifier can generate them randomly or, you know, in some way that's unpredictable to the quantum computer, then why aren't we done? Like, why do we even need the quantum computer at that point? Why, you know, why doesn't the verifier just take however it's generating the challenge circuits and use that to get its random bits? Okay, so fundamentally what our protocol is giving is it's giving an upgrade in the sort of level of unpredictability. Okay, so the challenge circuits can be pseudo-random. Okay, they can be generated using, let's say, a pseudo-random generator with a small seed. Um, uh, but but even you know even so, as long as they are not predictable right now by the quantum computer, then the quantum computer will have to respond with with uh, uh, with outputs that are truly random. Okay, and in fact, even if the pseudo-random generator were to be broken in the future, you know they, they would the, the outputs would still be secure. Right, so you get this sort of forward secrecy prop property, okay? And you also get that the random bits that the quantum computer generated were not previously known by anyone, you know, e even by the server that generated them. Okay. So, um, all right, so um, I'm running low on time, but uh, uh, let me, you know, just sort of show you what the, you know, the protocol looks like, and then you know at least sort of state the sort of theorems about it. So, uh, so, 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 so the protocol is is well. I, I've sort of already sketched it, 
but uh, you know, you have this classical client that generates, you know, a bunch of n qubit circuits, let's say C1, C2 up to CT, pseudo randomly, you know, in a way that mimics uh, truly random circuits. Then for each T, one at a time, the client sends the Tth quantum circuit to the server, and it demands back a response S sub T within a very short time. Now, in the honest case, that response should just be a list of K independent samples from the out from whatever output distribution you get by applying that quantum circuit to the to the all zero initial state. Okay. And then the client can pick a small number of random iterations. And for each one, it can, you know, uh, do this sort of benchmark test that, you know, the same one that Google used for its quantum supremacy experiments, uh, what's called linear cross entropy benchmark. I'll, I'll show you what that is on the next slide. Uh, and if the test passes, then the client has a, a bunch of responses from the server that, you know, under our hardness assumptions will be guaranteed to contain a lot of min entropy. Okay, so uh, so they're still not good enough to use for a cryptographic application, but you can now concatenate all of those responses together, and then take a small amount of seed randomness, which you know which the client has to have, and feed it into a seeded randomness extractor, just a, a classical one like the GUV extractor, uh, and you know, and that's known to produce a large. Uh, uh, a nearly uniformly random uh, uh, string, and that's and 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 then that's the output of the protocol. Okay, so so that so that step four is just purely classical. Okay, uh, so now what what is this linear cross entropy benchmark? Okay, so uh, it's basically just this. It's one of the simplest statistical tests that you could possibly write down. Okay, so all you do is you know you take your 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 you know the the outputs you know allegedly from your your quantum computer let's call those outputs s1 up to sk okay so each of those is an n bit string okay and now you know we're going to have a parameter b uh, which is some real number between 1 and 2 okay and we're going to sum up you know we're we're going you know using our classical computer and using 2 to the n time we're going to calculate what would be the probability that our ideal quantum circuit C would produce the output S1. Okay, and what would be the probability that it would, that it would produce S2 and so forth. Uh, and, and we're gonna just calculate all K of those probabilities and then sum them up. And then we're going to accept if and only if the sum exceeds a certain threshold. Okay, and what is that threshold? Well, you know, if, if, we, if we think about it, if you were just doing purely classical sample, you know, if you were just sampling uniformly at random, right, the, you know, an, an average S sub, S sub I would have a probability of two to the minus N just by normalization. So their sum should have an expectation of about K over two to the N, okay? Um, uh, but now, you know, what, what you can check is that if you had an ideal quantum computer, then this sum will in expectation be about 2k over 2 to the n. Okay, so it will be twice the trivial value. Okay, and, and that's where we're getting all of our play from. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, if, if you have a real quantum computer, then, you know, you should see outputs that are statistically concentrated among those that were, you know, that are more likely according to your ideal output distribution, right? And so, you know, they should cluster uh, at those. Now, in reality, because of the noise, you know, you won't be able to pass this test for B nearly as high as two. Uh, in Google's experiment, they did this for B equal to uh, about 1.002, okay? So just slightly, slightly above one, okay? But that, that, was, that was good enough. Okay, so uh, you know this is sort of the calculation that underlies this. Uh, that you know the the probabilities in the you know if you do a random circuit, uh, uh, the probabilities turn out to look like exponentially distributed random variables. You know with a mean of uh, two to the minus n. Okay, so uh, you know if I just do random, you know purely random sampling, then the histogram of the probabilities of the uh, of my observed samples looks like this red curve here. 
But if I sampled with a real quantum computer, then the histogram looks like this blue curve. Okay, because I should never see anything that had probability zero, you know, and the probability that I see some sample is weighted by its, you know, by its actual quantum probability. Okay, so so that 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 is what I'm trying to exploit here. Um, you know, and this is a lot like a computational version of the Bell inequality, right? You have this inequality that, like, classically B is at most one, and we're trying to violate it quantumly, even only you know just by a little bit is good enough. Okay, so um, I had some stuff about, you know, the 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 analysis of the protocol. Uh, because I am running out of time, I feel like maybe what I should do is sort of skip this and wrap up. And then if people want to ask me about it afterward, then I will uh, go back to it. Okay, but you know, the the analysis involves uh, uh, you know, a, pro a problem we invent called long list quantum supremacy verification. It's a little bit of a contrived problem, but uh, we, uh, you know, it seems very unlikely to be in, you know, uh, uh, in BQP or in AM or even in QCAM. And what we show is that if there were a way to spoof our protocol that was secretly deterministic, or even secretly low entropy, then that would give rise to a QCAM protocol for that LLQSV problem. Okay, and the proof of that relies on some uh, uh, approximate counting um, AM protocols. And then uh, we have to do a lot of technical work because that gets you that fine, you know, the outcome of each round should not be perfectly predictable uh, in advance. Okay, but you know we want more than that. We want that it should actually have like a linear number of bits of min entropy. Okay, and then we can get that too at the cost of making an even stronger hardness assumption, which is basically that there is no non-trivial QCAM protocol for this LLQSV problem, not even a sub-exponential one. Okay, and and then we have to figure out how exactly are we generating these challenge circuits? I said using a pseudo random generator. Okay, but now, of course, you know, we want a pseudo, at the very least, we need a pseudo random generator that's secure against the quantum computer, right? Uh, but it turns out we even need more than that, okay? Because, you know, if our scheme were broken, it wouldn't be obvious how do you verify that it's broken. Right, like you know, the output could just look all the same, and yet as 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 normal, and yet the outputs would just not be uniformly random, right? So it turns out that what you actually need are pseudo random generators that are secure against the complexity class QSZK, quantum statistical zero knowledge. Uh, fortunately, we have excellent candidates for such generators, so you know you can just uh, plug that in, um, even. You know, um, Okay, and then what you have to do is you have to show, you know, and this is maybe the most technical part, you have to show the accumulation of entropy across rounds, right? So just because one round of the protocol generates like omega of n bits of min entropy, then how do I know that the next round won't just generate those same bits over again? And I won't get more and more random bits as I repeat the protocol. Okay, so then you have to do some analysis to to uh, to show that. Uh, okay, now now uh, uh, so so we give these sort of reductions involving the, this LLQSV problem, but as an additional type of evidence for the security of our protocol, we prove that our protocol is secure in the random oracle model. Okay, now this might sound kind of funny or ironic to you, right? Because, you know, we like our goal is to produce random bits, right? In a world with a random oracle, it seems trivial to produce as, you know, random bits. Okay, but the, the key point is that we're going to be producing bits that are still random, even to someone who knew the oracle and who had unlimited computation time. Right. So, so, so I think it, it is meaningful that, that, you know, in the, in the random Oracle setting, we can prove that our scheme is secure and, you know, and that's, and that's just unconditional. Right. And basically our, our hardness assumptions uh, uh, become theorems in the random Oracle model. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they basically follow from the BBBV theorem, which is the result that tells you that Grover's algorithm is optimal for searching 
an unordered list. Okay, uh, that you know you need exponentially many queries to the oracle to uh, 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 to to break the scheme. That's what we prove. And in the random oracle setting, we're even able to do a little bit better than that. And this is the part that solves one of my main open problems from 2018. We can show that relative to a random oracle, uh, the scheme is secure even against an entangled adversary. So an adversary who could be arbitrarily entangled with the quantum computer which is a setting that, that people really, really care about in quantum cryptography. Okay, now I mentioned before that, that independently of, of me thinking of this in 2018, there was an independent approach to the, to the same problem of certified randomness using a single quantum computer uh, uh, by Berkursky et al. And you know, this used um, um, uh, 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 Coffrey, uh, um, ha um, 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 hash functions. It used like, uh, for example, using lattice-based cryptography. Okay, so it used some high-powered crypto. It was, you know, very, very closely related to Armala Mahadev's uh, breakthrough on, you know, making quantum computations verifiable uh, using using lattice-based crypto, which uh, uh, appeared uh, around the same time. This was this this was actually a little bit earlier. Okay, but now the the big advantage of the Brukowski et al. scheme compared to what we do is that in their scheme you have efficient classical verification. Okay, so you you know you don't need exponential time to verify what the quantum computer is doing, right? Like the the verifier has the private key to to the lattice based crypto system. And, and that allows them to verify what the quantum computer is doing in, in polynomial time. Okay, so, that, so that, that's better than us. The big disadvantage is that their scheme seems to require, I mean, it requires doing lattice-based cryptography on coherent superpositions of inputs, right? And that is, you know, that is basically seems nearly as hard uh, as, as implementing Shor's algorithm, you know, at scale. Right, and so that there is very little hope of doing that with any with any current or 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 or, or near term device. You know, like maybe maybe you know a, a thousand error corrected qubits would be like the bare minimum. Okay, so uh, so that's just the comparison. Let me give you some open problems. Um, so uh, uh, you know, of course, maybe may, maybe the biggest problem the, that we leave is can you get polynomial time classical verification and implementability on a near-term device via the same scheme, right? We've seen how to get one or the other, okay? But if you could get both, then that, I think that, that, that's what would really make this into the first truly practical application that, that is realizable with a quantum computer, okay? Uh, can you get more and more certified randomness by sampling with the same circuit over and over? That would make the protocol a lot more efficient and practical if you could. Can we prove the soundness of our scheme under less boutique complexity assumptions? Okay, what about for adversaries that are entangled with the quantum computer? Can we do that uh, uh, outside of the random Oracle model? Okay, and then, you know, there's the problem of, okay, this challenger who's generating, you know, this classical client who's generating the challenge circuits to send to the quantum computer, why should anyone else trust that challenger? Right. So, you know, maybe the challenger now believes that the outputs of the quantum computer are truly random, but, you know, uh, uh, sh shouldn't everyone else have a say in, in generating the challenges? So do we need to like have a whole bunch of challenges to then get XOR together? And, you know, do we you know already have a cryptographic problem and how do we generate challenges for the quantum computer that everyone trusts were, were generated correctly? Okay, so that was uh, all I wanted to say. I apologize for uh, going a little over time, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, well, thanks, Kat. Sure. Um, yeah, let's uh, open the floor for a few questions. Um, and if not, I can also take us off the recording and we can um, just hang out for a bit. So actually, I, I had one question about yeah, sure. this the source of like becoming exponentially hard to verify. Mm -hmm. It's both because the number of qubits and the computation 
needed because of this like noise in the it's it, no it's it's it, no? it's not about the noise it's not about the noise it, it, it it's really just that the number of qubits gets large and you know if i want to simulate a system of n qubits then you know classically i expect that generically i will need something like two to the n time right mm -hmm. now now you know sometimes one can be clever and get around that okay but now now the real crux of the problem is that you know the 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 same assumptions you know that we need for our scheme to be secure right those are the very same things that are making the verification take exponential time so we could say like if the verification were not exponential it would have to be because the scheme itself was not secure i see you know in, in the sense that it could be spoofed by like a you know a, 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 a an adversary who was who was seek you know either a quantum or a classical adversary, but someone who was generating the outputs in a secretly deterministic or secretly low entropy way. So uh, yeah, so so, so 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 breaking out of that. Can, you know, breaking the connection between verification and spoofing. You know, I see that as like one of the central open problems for, for quantum supremacy right now, both for, for our randomness, for this randomness protocol, and even independently of this protocol. All right, th thanks. Hey, Scott. Yeah, go on. Doesn't that mean that you can't do this on noisy quantum computers because there's like that theory mesh? Well, no, uh, you, 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 you absolutely can do this on noisy quantum computers, which is good because all quantum computers, you know, that, oh. that, that, that exist for the foreseeable oh. future are, are noisy quantum computers, right? But what it says is that the noise, the rate of noise has to be low enough that you know the that that of the you know whatever classical spoofing methods are out there uh, none of them will work right That's so you scale. Say like 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 evading classical spoofing uh, is not a sufficient condition for you know a, a secure certified randomness scheme but it is certainly a necessary condition right if you know if if someone can classically spoof you know your you know your experiment then you cannot use that experiment for a you know a certified randomness scheme like this one okay now it's important to understand you know i said a little bit about this but it's important to understand what is the status quo here okay so if you look at the you know paper from the past year by like boaz barak and uh, uh, misha luca and jean gao et al right they give an efficient classical simulation of like noisy you know, rand, uh, uh, quantum supremacy experiments, but, you know, it can only get a lin linear cross entropy score that is like 1.0002, as opposed to 1.002 that Google got, right? Mm -hmm. So Google is still a factor of 10 better than, than what that algorithm can reproduce, right? Uh, you know, the, 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 there, there, was, there was a different paper, but, you know, that, that's sort of not, you know, that has an algorithm that, that works in the scaling limit. That was a Haranov Vazirani at all, but that one is not really practical at 50 or 60 qubits. Okay, and and you know, and 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 we 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 you know we we kind of knew that thing you know that these problems would become classically easy in the scaling limit. You know, there there was a little loophole where where maybe it wouldn't become easy, and 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 that paper basically closed that loophole. Okay, but you know, so 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 the, 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 this is why I said at the beginning of the talk that that some quantum supremacy you know remains right at the regime of fifty or sixty qubits you know, even compared to the very best classical algorithms that we know right now. Okay, but certainly if, if you were going to deploy a scheme like this one for cryptographic purposes, right, or, you know, like in, in the real world, then a prerequisite would be, you know, I would want like much, much safer quantum supremacy uh, uh, via via sampling than, 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 than what we have right now, right? Like, you know, maybe, maybe just, just, do it with you know ninety nine point nine percent fidelity gates and with you know uh, sixty or seventy qubits or something like that. Maybe maybe higher depth to uh, evade the uh, tensor network simulations. Sure. Yeah.
All right. All well, right. Um, let's take us off the recording.